Hello and welcome to On Point. I'm Alicia Diegas. President-elect Donald Trump's rhetoric throughout the campaign instilled fear and uncertainty among many people. Trump targeted undocumented Latino immigrants, Muslims, women, and people with disabilities, and he now has to be president to all those groups of people he attacked. In 2012, the Obama administration established a new immigration policy known as DACA, which gives certain undocumented immigrants eligibility for a work permit and a renewal for a two-year period of deferred action from deportation. And the DREAM Act gives some undocumented immigrants the opportunity to achieve legal status through academics or the military. Trump has threatened to overturn both. One seasoned student says he was shocked at the result of the president election. I feel like for a long period after it happened, I was just in the state of total disbelief, um, like I feel like a lot of people were. California politicians and activists are already laying the groundwork to fight Trump's policies. Still, a lot of young undocumented immigrants in California say they're worried about their futures and the futures of their families and friends. On Point's Nick Torres has more on the story. Thank you, Alicia. I would like to thank my guests today for joining us. We have Chris Farias, a dreamer, and Dr. Glenn Omatsu, Asian American Studies professor and academic liaison for EOP. Our first question today, what are dreamers at CSUN doing to prepare for a Trump presidency? Let's start with you, Chris. All right, uh, so I, I don't know a lot of um, students from, that are dreamers because I feel like we are a very small community, which sometimes sucks um, because I've always wanted to reach out and you, you, you never find the people, the right people. Um, but the few that I do know, we, at first we weren't, we weren't sure if we should go and follow all the protests that they were doing like in LA if we should stay quiet, if we should fight. Um, on social media, everything was negative when uh, we saw the protests like on, on the freeways and all of that. And then it was just making us look bad. But then I was talking to one of my professors and she told us like, but, but why do we have to stop? Like, why does, why is it as soon as someone tells us to stop because we look bad, we have to like stop. Um, this is our time to like show the media, the world, Trump, like that we are uh, together and that we are going to fight for what we deserve. Um, it, it's it's a bummer to like be seen as like a criminal, um, someone that doesn't go to school, someone that isn't intelligent when we really are and we really do stick together. So um, I'm excited for what's to come. Um, this is a time, like I said, to stick together and yeah, we'll see. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Matsu? Well, under EOP, the Educational Opportunity Program, uh, we have what's called the EOP Dream Center. It's a, it's a project that was originally started by our late director, Jose Luis Vargas. Uh, he combined with a number of you know, programs around campus to provide more you know, services for students that are covered under the DREAM Act. And um, uh, our, direct, our coordinator over there at the Dream Center is very, very concerned. He's working, working with a number of departments on our campus, and a number of faculty will come forward to also, you know, provide support and resources as well. So at this particular time on the CSUN campus especially, I think that we have, you know, students like Chris, you know, who are, are you know, intent on defending rights, but we also have a number of supporters who are doing the same thing. Okay. Um, again, with you, Chris, can you describe your story or experience about migrating here to the United States? Yes, uh, it was back in 2001 when I was just five years old. It was in April, almost finishing kindergarten. I remember just going to my grandma's house like we always would and all of a sudden we were packing our bags. I wasn't sure why, what was going on. I just remember seeing my grandma, like my aunts, my cousins just crying and like saying bye to us. Um, get, we got dropped off at, in, at a bus stop and I, I still didn't know what was going on. Um, my dad had came two years before. I came with my mom and my younger brother to the US. So my mom was like, we're gonna go see your dad. Like that's what we're gonna go do. We're gonna go see your dad. Uh, I remember it was, this was in uh, Uruapan, Michoacan, Mexico. Um, we went to uh, Mexicali and uh, we were placed in a house and I still didn't know what was going on. I remember seeing a lot of like families with other kids and the kids were crying and I was crying too because I didn't know like really like still like wh what was going on. Um, we started, we waited there for like two days and then we started going through the desert. Uh, I remember um, we were exhausted, all the kids just crying. Um, we were told to like not make noises during like the day. It was really hot. 
Uh, my young, I was five, my younger brother was three, so um, my mom would have to carry him. Uh, and then I remember all of a sudden we started running because people and horses were coming after us. Um, now that I'm older, now I know that it was probably ice, um, but we were just hiding under the bushes. I remember when I was hiding, I was looking around and I, was, I would see clothes that were left there, toys that were left there. Um, and the moms, they were just so scared of what was gonna happen. We waited there for a few hours and then they told us, okay, like we can go. Um, so we started running and there was a truck waiting for us on, on a road. Um, and I remember I, we, I jumped in the, in, in the back of the truck and an uh, older lady, she was like on top of me and like we were told not to move. We were covered with like this like quilt. Um, and they were just like, no one talks, like just go. Uh, and then we were just on the road. Um, we did get stopped, and it was the police, but for some miracle reason, they never checked the back. They asked the driver, like, what do you have in the back? And he's like, I just have fruit, like, that's it. I, he never checked, it, it was a miracle, and he let us go. Um, my dad actually didn't know that we were coming, um, so when my mom contacted him, we were already in Phoenix. We were in the house, and all of the families were contacting their husbands or wives or their, their families and they were getting picked up and we weren't because my dad didn't know we were coming. Um, I don't know the situation of my parents like when I was younger. I don't know if they weren't talking, I, like, but he wasn't coming. Um, so my mom was worried. She, she didn't know what we were doing. She was only 22 with two kids. Um, and finally we received a call that, that, he, that he was coming, that he was on his way. Um, when I came, when we, when we were about to leave a day before, the cops came to the house. We were run, we ran to like the restroom. We were, we, we hid in the restroom shower and people did get caught. People that were with us did get caught and they took them back to Mexico. They got deported. We didn't. Um, the next morning, my dad came for us and I didn't recognize him. I, I was always like excited to see my dad after two years, but I didn't recognize him. He, it, he was just a guy. Um, my younger brother too, he was crying in his arms because he didn't want to be with my dad because we didn't know him. Um, but my mom was like, yeah, this is your dad. Like, you know, um, we stopped in, we drove from Phoenix to Anaheim, California. Um, and I remember the very first thing that I asked my dad that was American, I guess, um, he didn't have a phone, so we used a payphone and he was inserting the coins, and then I was like, what is this? And then he was telling me, oh, this is a quarter. This is like 25 cents. And then he started telling me this is a penny. And um, I was intelligent, but I I still didn't understand why I was here. Um, we He lived in the back of a house. It was a garage. Um, it, it was messy. Um, I remember my mom was like, I thought this was the American dream. I thought we were gonna live, you were gonna live in a big house. Um, He's like, no, this is reality. Like, this is how we live. Um, it's, we don't get the jobs that we want. Yeah, we're discriminated. Um, I would hear all these words and I didn't understand what, what it meant, but it, it, I was already, you know, my mentality, my mentality was like, okay, then I'm different from everyone else because of what my dad's saying. Um, I started school, I finished kindergarten. Um, I remember the first day of class, we were coloring and it was a dinosaur and it was labeled with different numbers and every each number represented a color, but I was just coloring whatever because I didn't know the rules and the teacher, she was speaking to me in English and I was just crying because I didn't know what she meant. And two uh, girls helped me because they spoke Spanish and they told me, oh, like, they're like, oh, this is a Mexican boy, he just came from Mexico, he doesn't know English and stuff. And I was just crying to the teacher like, can you please speak to me in Spanish? And she would just like hug me, but like that was it. Uh, and that was April. And then by, in June when we finished, I was able to learn the alphabet. I was able to learn the numbers in English, the colors. So I didn't flunk. A lot of the people thought, no, like he's gonna flunk because like he, he doesn't speak English. But no, like I, I was so motivated to just not be different because that's what the first thing that my dad told us that we were different. So I was like, no, I'm not gonna be different. Um, in first grade, I was 
they would make fun of me because I had a different accent back then. I didn't know how to pronounce like perfectly the numbers. I was I was going to like ESL classes, um, so it was always like tough. And um, I think that because of seeing everything how it was, I was always so motivated to continue, and I was able to surpass all the goals in class and. I was one of the top students in elementary school and forward. That's good. Um, hearing that story, Doctor, how does that make you feel? Well, it's interesting because, you know, like we who teach in EOP and also within ethics studies, you know, we're in a different situation than most of the other professors here at the university because most of the students in our classes actually are our teachers. You know, and I teach writing classes, so the students actually write their life stories and their family life stories and their essays. And their life stories are filled with different kinds like hardships and struggles. But the important thing is like Chris's story is also struggles of triumphing over the different kinds like hardships. So that's where I always regard my students as my heroes. You know, and I think most ethnic studies professors will say exactly the same thing. Okay, uh, in Trump's profile for Times Person of the Year, he shows more sympathy towards dreamers. He says, we're going to work something out that's going to make people happy and proud. He also went on to say that dreamers were brought here at a very young age, they've gone to school, they've worked, and they feel like they're stuck in Never Never Land. Do you guys think he will actually protect dreamers moving forward? I, I think that he, I, I don't trust him. Um, since day one, he, he made us look like we were the bad guys in the story, and obviously he's just he's being smart now with what he's saying. Um, but I I don't trust him. It, it's something scary because a lot of the dreamers, a lot of the Latinos' families aren't very informed, so they can easily get convinced with what the media, what he's saying. Um, and it's scary. Uh, I I don't trust him. I know that it, we have to be aware of what's going on, and as a as a community, we should really stick together and inform each other that this guy is not, he's not saying the truth. I agree because it's not simply Trump, but you know, whoever he appoints, you know, and um, what's going to happen is that the people who supported Trump are also going to demand that he live up to certain kinds like promises, right? And so we're entering a very, very dangerous period, you know, not simply for like um, the dreamers, but I would say for all immigrants and all families of immigrants as well. Uh, again, Doctor, um, a lot of students involved in the educational or uh, opportunity program here at, on campus are Latino. Uh, what are some of the, the concerns they have ex expressed to you about a Trump presidency? Uh, well, it's, it's not only the students themselves, but I think that they're also concerned with members of their family. Because if we start to think about it, you know, like almost every family who, uh, you know, uh, here is U.S. born has immigrants, you know, connected with their family, either through marriage or through relatives. Right, and then also within the families, there are also undocumented immigrants as well. So every single student is concerned, maybe not about their own status, but what's going to happen to members of their family. Uh, they're also concerned with their neighborhoods, you know, because they live in neighborhoods where they also know there's, there's a lot of fear that's happening. Okay, um, poll results showed Donald Trump was able to attract 33% of the Latino male vote and 26% of the female Latino vote. Uh, after saying all the things he said about the Latino community, um, why do you think such an unexpected high number of Latino voters su supported Trump? Uh, for me, first of all, I've, I've read other places where those statistics are incorrect. Um, but if we do want to go with that, I feel that, unfortunately, a lot of the guys um, they, there's a lot of, like, if we speak about Latinos, we are, some of them are very conservative. So when they come, when they have to pick, oh, Hillary, women, or Trump, man, they usually go with that. And that, that's another um, misinformed uh, situation for them. Um, so it's, it's uh, unfortunate that the statistics say that. I don't know, what do you think about that? I, I think a lot also has to do with, you know, like um, people vote for candidates not on particular kinds of like issues, but on other issues, right? And so a lot of times like what happens is that, you know, they would vote for Trump based on what they think that he's gonna do on a certain kind of like issue and they ignore more other kinds of like issues until that official directly affects them, you know? And that's what's increasingly going to happen within the coming months. And uh, this question's for you, doctor. Um, do you believe the alt-right, which is a white nationalist, neo-Nazi cult, 
feels justified in their cause, which is to create a complete Anglo-Saxon uh, nation, excluding immigrants and members from the global community. Um, after Trump's words on immigration, his proposed Muslim ban, and his appointment of Steve Bannon, Breitbart CEO, as White House advisor. I, th I think that they sort of like feel that they have an advantage right now on getting involved in ruling and also policy making. But at the same time, I think that they're realistic that Trump is not going to do everything that they want to do. I think the dangerous time at this particular time is that, you know, because of like Trump's dangerous rhetoric, uh, different people will be doing different kinds of like things that under President Obama would not be considered acceptable. Right? And so that's why there's a rise in hate crimes. There's also, you know, microaggressions that now have become normal. You know, people feel that they can say things that normally, you know, they would have been more in check about. And speaking of the hate crimes, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center reported over 800 cases of hateful harassment or intimidation in, in the United States 10 days after the election. Do you think this, is, this type of behavior is just the beginning of something bigger or will it die down? I think it's the beginning of something bigger. I remember th like the next day even when Trump was elected, um, I, I felt so uncomfortable on campus because I now I didn't know whoever's looking at me, are they looking because they're saying, oh, like, poor guy, or are they just simply looking because, like, people look. Uh, on, even, like, on Twitter, like, right now, like, every, like social media is very big. So Twitter, Facebook, every, everyone was scared. I felt scared. I, I was... I felt very ashamed, but not knowing why I would feel ashamed of myself. So to see that on social media, especially, people would post something and then it was it would all turn negative, and it, it was just like a never-ending thing. And still now, I can simply post something, anything that involves Trump, I will get a lot of like hate comments saying, "Oh, like chill out, like it's not that bad, this and that." Well, it's your fault for being this and that. So it's just the beginning. Yeah, I think I'd also add that hate crimes traditionally are underreported, right? So then when we see an increase within hate crimes, we know that there's a lot of other things that are happening for different reasons. People don't report them as happening. So I agree that this is just the beginning of what we're starting to see. Okay, and do you think the trend of nationalism is going global? Well, to a certain extent, I think I think that, you know, most people have analyzed Trump's rise to power in terms of like, you know, similar kinds of like rises in power in the Philippines, you know, within Western Europe, et cetera, et cetera. I think what's missing, though, in those particular kinds of like stories is that there's also strong resistance movements, grassroots movements of people as well, right? So a lot of times, you know, we shouldn't say that, you know, like, um, uh, you know, what's happening with, with the Trump presidency is that, you know, therefore, you know, more nationalists have like, gained power. At the same time, there's a very, very strong grassroots movement that, you know, at this particular time, you know, for different kinds of reasons, doesn't get focused on as much. On to the topic of social media. Um, do you believe media literacy has should be taught in schools, possibly from middle school and up? Uh, I think that now, because media is pretty important, unfortunately, it should be taught in in a good way of like how we should use uh, social media. I feel like right now it's so easy to say words that you really can't say in person to someone. So. Uh, it should be something. I know that I have a younger brother, he's 13, and it's all about social media to him. Um, it's a bit scary to see that now, like, they don't really, like, go out and play like I, like I used to when I was younger. But um, if, if that's the case, I think it should be used as something more positive and be taught as something more positive. Yeah, you know, and I, th I think that we who are in the university, especially students, have a great deal of power, right? Uh, because, you know, like um, with something like social media, there's both advantages and disadvantages, right? Uh, so social media has the advantage of actually bringing more literacy or more, you know, interest in different kinds of like issues in a much wider scale than, say, like print media, right? But at the same time, then, you know, then there's certain kinds of like problems that have come up, right? You know, but those problems can be addressed in different ways, especially by younger people, right? Who are more politically conscious, people like yourself. You know? Why do you guys think Trump was able to get away with some of the certain things he said about, such as mocking a disabled person, calling Mexicans criminals, rapists, and murderers, and his misogynistic remarks? Uh, well, for me, I think that he he was he was able to get away from a lot of that because, like I said, the media. Um, 
he, it, it was surprising for me to see that, like, okay, did people forget about all, everything that he said, like, what, what's going on? Um, but he was very smart. I think that he, he had this thing where, okay, let me be, let me create chaos at first, and let me say all of this, and people are gonna pay attention to me, and I'm gonna be able to say whatever I want, and then once people pay attention, then I'll sound smart and kind of help them remember, forget what I said and help them kind of love me and and, and show that I actually care for them. So it, it, it sucks because like they forgot about all of, that, all of that. Like what I was saying earlier, everything is negative and then when us Latinos say, wait, but what about when he said this and that? People forgot because like he was so smart to like include it at the very beginning of everything that just people tend to forget and it sucks. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say Trump is probably, ho hopefully it's not the beginning of a trend, I don't know. So you, I think you would have a better idea of being in the field itself. But he's the first candidate that actually comes from like reality TV into like, you know, politics. Usually it's a situation where a politician is shaped by media, but not like, you know, they're created by media, right? And coming from reality TV, I think then, you know, he, he kind of like, you know, uh, created a certain kind of like image. I'll say different kinds of like things. I'm speaking from, you know, from, uh, you know, reality and things like that. Although people, I don't think, accept it as, you know, this is reality, right? I think the other thing is that, you know, uh, if you think about it, you know, he's the first person who's able as a billionaire to, you know, kind of like, you know, come and say that he's, he's speaking on behalf of like common people. You know, it's kind of like ridiculous, but again, it's kind of like, coming for reality TV. Do you guys think if Hillary Clinton were to make those remarks the same in the same rhetoric, they would be dismissed as Trump's were? Uh, I feel like, mm, for, for whatever reason, I feel like it, it wouldn't have been as bad. Um, not that I agree on it, but like I was saying, like media, um, the, People, because like what he was saying, uh, Trump comes from like a superstar uh, life. So they're like, okay, well, this guy, like, let's let's talk crap to him because he that's what he, he knows what to do. And then with Hillary, it's like people think, okay, well, she's like she's in politics, like she knows what she's saying. Maybe she's right. Uh, so I feel like if Hillary wanted to say something bad, it would have been handled a lot differently just because of her background. Um, and then Trump, well, he, he started bad and he had us not like him. Uh, even considering people were already against Hillary on her whole email scandals, you, you think um, the same way? I don't know, what do you think? Uh, well, I, th I think in general, you know, if we, if we look at the current election and then also kind of like what's going on around the world, right, there's a lot of dissatisfaction of people of the existing political kinds of like system, right? Uh, you know, you could have somebody like Bernie Sanders, a socialist, and he gets a lot of votes, right? Uh, and that speaks of certain dissatisfaction. Somebody like Trump, who, you know, criticizes the Republican Party, gets a lot of votes, right? Uh, so there's a general dissatisfaction, I think, within, within the United States, but throughout the world on the existing political kind of like system and how rulers are chosen. For Chris, uh, being able, now that you're being able to go to school here in, in the United States, how has DACA changed your life? Oh, DACA. Um before I, I didn't know about DACA, I didn't think I was going to come to school. I, in, in the community where I'm from, you're kind of you're kind of taught that like you're not going to make it. And I remember still like junior year of high school, um, they were asking me, gonna, "What school are you going to go to?" I'm like, "I don't know. Like, I'm not going to go. Like, I'm just going to work because I can't." Um, and it's all about like not being informed. I, for just uh, whatever reason, I was in class in my uh, AP Spanish class. And I heard like a couple of girls like talking about going to the Boys and Girls Club. And then I'm like, what is that? Like, wh what are you guys doing there? And then they're like, come check it out. Like, it's it's a college bound program. Like, they help students. And my, my response was like, oh, but like, I'm undocumented. Like, they're not going to help me. And they're like, no, yeah, like, there's a few there. And, and then for the first time, I was like, okay, like, I'm not the only one. Like, people actually go to this. I went and they, they explained what DACA was. And uh, for me, that was like my way out. Like I, like I, like I told you guys, I never, I, I didn't want to be different. I wanted to be included. So I learned all about DACA. I was able to help go back home and help the other kids, the other seniors in high school, like apply for all of this and tell them what it was. And whenever, whenever I would mention it, they wouldn't know what it is. Um, so DACA has allowed me to believe in myself and to push me. And now that like things like these are happening, it's scary because. 
it, I think back of like how excited I, I was for this and how less excited I am because it's just, it's scary and it's dangerous. Um, and, and it's definitely something that I do not, I don't wish that they take it away from us. And uh, quickly, uh, if Trump removes or denies the renewal of DACA, do you know what your alternatives are? Uh, I do not know. It's, um, it, like I said, it's scary. My, my DACA actually expires in May, so I'm already thinking, like, what am I going to do? I, I was able to renew it myself two years ago, and it was, like, the most exciting thing because I'm like, this just means that I'm going to continue with what I'm doing. But now it's like I think about a lot of things like, it, can I go to school? Like, can I can still work le legally in the U.S.? I Like, what's up? Um, a lot of us, I think, that are very confused and very scared of what's going on. So even when we ask each other questions, we can't answer them. So we'll see. And uh, before we have to go, our last question is, uh, is CSUN doing enough to protect our dreamers? I don't think so, but you know, but I, I, I think that you know, like what we have to do is we have to take inspiration from students themselves, right, who are fighting, you know, and, and also like remember the stories, you know, and again I teach from ethnic studies, so like there's a lot of stories that don't make it into history books, right? Uh, and those individual stories I think are important. So I'll just quickly mention one story, Ralph Lazo, you know, he uh, is a um, graduate from CSUN, he got his master's degree here, he passed away in the 1990s. But his story is a moving story of solidarity because, you know, in 1942 he was a high school student at Belmont High School. Uh, his Japanese American friends were sent to concentration camps. He as a Mexican American felt it was wrong. But as somebody, you know, who's a high school student, he didn't have that much power. But what he did is on his own, he registered himself as being Japanese ancestry so that he could go to camps with his friends because he felt it was an injustice, right? And so I think that like actions like that need to be encouraged, you know, throughout society, not only here at the CSUN campus. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. I would like to thank my guests for joining us today. was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He knows he's a pretty big deal. How could you not love him? Thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on social media by searching Season On Point. You can watch us on LA 36 Sunday mornings at 11.30 or on Santa Clarita Cable Television at 11.05. Or you can listen to us at KCSN 88.5 FM at 5.30 also on Sunday mornings. For all of us here on On Point, I'm Alicia Diegas.